welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, The Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to today's show. This is Jason Hartman, your host. And as you may or may not know, every 10th show, we kind of do a special tradition here that originated with my Creating Wealth show, where we do a topic that is actually off topic on purpose, something just to do with general life and more successful living. And that's exactly what we're going to do today with our special guest. Again, 10th show is off topic, and it is very much intentional just for personal enrichment and I hope you enjoy today's show. And we will be back with our guest in just a moment. I've never really thought of Jason as subversive, but I just found out that's what Wall Street considers him to be. Really? Now, how is that possible at all? Simple. Wall Street believes that real estate investors are dangerous to their schemes because the dirty truth about income property is that it actually works in real life. I know. I mean, how many people do you know, not including insiders, who created wealth with stocks, bonds, and mutual funds? Those options are for people who only want to pretend they're getting ahead. Stocks and other non-direct traded assets are a losing game for most people. The typical scenario is you make a little, you lose a little, and spin your wheels for decades. That's because the corporate crooks running the stock and bond investing game will always see to it that they win. This means, unless you're one of them, you will not win. And unluckily for Wall Street, Jason has a unique ability to make the everyday person understand investing the way it should be. He shows them a world where anything less than a 26% annual return is disappointing. Yep, and that's why Jason offers a one-book set on creating wealth that comes with 20 digital download audios. He shows us how we can be excited about these scary times and exploit the incredible opportunities this present economy has afforded us. We can pick local markets untouched by the economic downturn, exploit packaged commodities investing, and achieve exceptional returns safely and securely. I like how he teaches you how to protect the equity in your home before it disappears and how to outsource your debt obligations to the government. And this set of advanced strategies for wealth creation is being offered for only $197. To get your Creating Wealth Encyclopedia Book 1, complete with over 20 hours of audio, go to jasonhartman.com forward slash store. If you want to be able to sit back and collect checks every month, just like a banker, Jason's Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series is for you. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Kelly McGonigal to the show. She is a health psychologist at Stanford and the author of The Willpower Instinct, What Could Be a More Appropriate Topic for the New Year. Kelly, welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Well, good. So two two really important topics, actually. Willpower, which, of course, a lot of people in the new year, every year, you know, the gym memberships increase and the health clubs are crowded and the diets are sold and the goals are set. And then by about mid-February, you know, it all sorts to start kind of peter out. And, and you talk about two areas of, of great interest to me, uh, willpower, of course, but also stress and, and whether it's good or bad. Let's talk about willpower first, if we can, and kind of talk about some of your latest research on the topic. So the book is based on a class I teach called The Science of Willpower that I started teaching because I got really frustrated by the fact that I would talk to people, uh, undergraduates at Stanford, people in the community, who would say things like, I have this really big goal, or I know I need to change this thing, but I don't have the willpower to do it. 
And uh, that really was at odds with what I knew about research on self-control and change, which says that willpower, it's not a trait that people lack. It's more like a strength that can be trained. And I decided that it was really important to, to offer a class specifically about the science of willpower to help empower people to realize that change was possible and the fact that they were struggling with things like temptation or distraction and motivation, that that was utterly human. And it didn't say something about you know, what was uniquely wrong or weak about them. And I feel like understanding the science of willpower actually gives us a tremendous amount of self-compassion for why change is hard and, and why we may give in again and again to bad habits while also giving us some really helpful strategies for making changes. So it sounds like you're saying then that willpower is, uh, it's just like a muscle. When you exert your muscles, they become stronger and more durable and, and more, um, they develop greater stamina. I mean, is willpower, is that, is that a good analogy for willpower? It's a great analogy. It also explains why when we're making a change or, or moving towards a goal, we sometimes feel willpower exhausted that we can also fatigue that strength, but that as we challenge ourselves more and more, we develop a stronger willpower reserve. Okay, so you know, give us an example. If someone came to you and you were their personal trainer for willpower, what would be the, the training program? How, how do we do this? What, you know, what, what's step one, two, and three, if you will? Well, the first thing I actually encourage people to do in the class and in the book is rather than try to change something or to control themselves, to think of themselves kind of like willpower athletes who need to be well-rested and well-fueled. There's a real biology to willpower, which says that in order to be the best version of ourselves, we actually need to have a brain that is well-rested and a body that is well-energized. You know, when we're sleep-deprived, or when our blood sugar is low, the brain and the body shift into the state of being impulsive, being distracted, being stressed out. And so before I even have people try to make big changes in their lives, I ask them to commit to an act of self-care, one that will support the energy of their brain and body. Could be prioritizing sleep a little bit more, could be exercise or movement, and not necessarily you know, a killer workout, but any sort of physical activity actually fuels the energy of the body. Could be something like meditation, which really improves how the brain uses energy and how the body deals with stress. And to do all of that before you get started in, you know, trying to, to quit smoking or start a diet. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Okay, so is, is willpower the same thing as, as mental toughness, the same thing as tenacity, or, or are there some distinctions here that we should make? I think willpower is a pretty big category, and mental toughness is a strength that supports it. You know, I define willpower as the ability to make choices that reflect your highest goals and values, even when it's difficult, and even when some part of you doesn't want to. And so we need some mental toughness to do that, to deal with setbacks, to, to find the energy to do things that are difficult. And I actually call that I willpower, the ability to not give up the ability to do things uh, to make progress towards your goals, even when you're tired, to really prioritize what matters instead of only dealing with what feels urgent. Um, but we also need something called I won't power, which is the ability to actually uh, recognize and then control impulses that move you away from your goals when you're facing a temptation, or when you're about to say something that might hurt someone's feelings, to be able to recognize that before you do it and actually hold yourself back and we also need a, a different kind of strength that I call I want power. And that's the ability to actually know what your goals and values are. It's a tremendous strength that most people don't invest a lot of time in, you know, to every day think about what matters to me most. Not what feels urgent, not what's worrying me and stressing me out, but who do I want to be and what do I want to make my choices on the basis of. And that's also a strength that we can train. I like those, you know, sort of little phrases you have. I will power, I won't power, I want power. Do you have any more of those? Those are great. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's really helpful to think in terms of your challenges like that. We've already talked about self-care as being the foundation for self-control. And I, I like that phrase because it actually it points to a whole number of things that the science of willpower tells us that goes against many people's intuitions. And one of them is the intuition most people have that self-criticism is the foundation for self-control. And the science suggests that, that self-criticism, guilt, and shame actually deplete our willpower, you know, even more than sleep deprivation would. 
where self-care, self-compassion actually restores our willpower. You know, on that self-care topic, when you were talking about that a few minutes ago, I thought of people that are, are marathon runners and do these crazy long distance, incredible endurance athletic feats. But is that, isn't that an example of incredible willpower at a time when you're beating the heck out of your body? And most people would give up. I, I know I certainly would. One third of the way through an Ironman, if not much sooner. <laughs> It definitely, I think it's actually one of the reasons why doing something like that is so attractive to many people because you recognize that you are training these, these three different strengths we need. You know, one of the best predictors of whether or not someone can finish a marathon or, or any sort of event like that is their ability to tolerate distress, you know, the, the physical symptoms of discomfort to, to override fatigue. And that turns out to be one of the best predictors of all sorts of things, like whether you are able to recover from an addiction. And in some ways, actually training ourselves, whether through exercise or other challenges, to actually stick with something despite discomfort or despite anxiety, that's actually training us to meet any challenge with more willpower. Yeah, amazing. So, okay, so training willpower, that's one area, and I may want to come back and ask you some more questions about that, but just to make sure we cover the topic, let's talk about stress for a moment. I have heard the concept of eustress, which I believe is EU stress, uh, probably, Mm -hmm. which is like the good stress, I believe, and then there's obviously bad stress that everybody talks about and knows about. Distinguish the whole stress phenomenon for us, if you would. Well, so when I talk about stress, I'm mostly talking about reaction of the body, which doesn't distinguish too much between eustress or distress. It's a reaction of the mind and the body that is designed to help you focus on what is important. It gives you energy to take action. And it also uh, tends to motivate us to try to connect with others who might be able to support us uh, or who are important in our community and, and relationships that matter to us. And we have this physical stress response, you know, anytime we recognize that we are up against a challenge. And too often, I think, in our society, we think of stress as being a fundamentally bad thing because often the situations that trigger that response are ones we really would rather avoid. You know, maybe we don't want to have a conflict with someone. We don't want to feel pressure at work. We don't want to get bad news. But I've been uh, really fascinated with the idea that you can not necessarily want the situations that trigger stress but really appreciate the mind-body response of stress as something that can help you reach your goals if you have the right mindset about it. Okay, so in your TED Talk, uh, you talked about that, that people believed, I mean, this is the old you know, psychosomatic medicine concept that still not enough people are uh, aware of, but, it, but it, you know, it sounds like the belief that stress is bad makes it much worse, right? Yes, this was actually, to me, this was some pretty scary news because as a health psychologist, I was trained, stress is bad, stress makes you sick, stress will kill you. And uh, I spent a lot of time telling people that in my classes and basically making people scared of stress. And then a few years ago, I came across the first study showing that stress uh, only seems to increase the risk of death among people who believe that stress is bad for you. Whereas people who experience a lot of stress but don't believe that stress is harmful have the lowest rate of mortality of anyone, even compared to people who don't have a lot of stress in their lives. And, and since that first study came out, there have been a number of studies by different researchers, different labs, different populations, showing the same effect. And it made me really rethink the way that I was talking about stress and it motivated me to find a way of reframing stress that would... Um, avoid possibly the, the more toxic effects of stress. Yeah, okay, so, so reframing it. How do we reframe it? Give us uh, some examples of what we can do to, to think about it properly in the proper so one, context. One really exciting way to reframe stress is to think of the physical stress response as being something that gives you access to energy and courage. Um, there's research that's come out of Harvard uh, showing that when people view their own anxiety and stress response, their pounding heart, maybe they're breathing faster, if they view that as their brain and body trying to give them energy, it actually allows them to perform better under pressure. It reduces the um, felt experience of anxiety, and it even makes the stress response healthier. You know, you can have the exact same stressful experience, the exact same physical symptoms of stress, but when you appreciate that it's your brain and body trying to give you energy, it subtly shifts the physiology of stress 
towards a state that is actually cardiovascularly very healthy and not likely to increase your risk of, of illness or cardiovascular disease. So that's an easy reframe. And there are other ways to sort of see the, the upside of stress response that that makes it less of um, something that we might want to avoid or resist. You know, that reminds me a little bit of uh, the times in my life, and you know, I've certainly heard stories about other people experiencing this one. You know, when someone wants to do something and then, and then a, a, a person that is important or authoritative in their life will say, you can't do that. And they'll actually overcome all odds to make it happen, just to kind of prove the other person wrong or prove to themselves that they can do it. Is, is any of that in there? Yes. You know, in, in some ways, stress is, is, will give you access to your own resources, including your strength and your motivation. And so although I don't recommend it as like a parenting strategy to tell people they can't do something, when you yourself get that message, even just understanding like, okay, this is an opportunity and it feels bad when someone tells me that, well, this feeling bad is actually giving me access to my motivation and to recognize that that can also be a source of strength. So, so it gives you access to your own resources. I really like the way you put that. Very, very interesting. Well, what else can we learn from, from stress? And, you know, I guess kind of that, that thing I mentioned of the, the stress and the, the challenge of the being told you can't do it is a, kind of a, a willpower. Maybe that's where they, one area where they cross over and the two merge together. But do, do the two interrelate in a lot of ways, the, the topic of willpower and stress? Definitely. I mean, so one of the things that seems to be the case is stress can shift us into a state of focusing on the short term rather than the long term. And stress can then make us more likely, say, to give in to temptation or to procrastinate. And in that case, I think actually the solution for the stress and the solution for the willpower challenge is the same. Um, And that is to seek social support and connection. That seems to be the antidote to sort of many of the challenges that, that make us feel isolated, make us feel sort of unhelpfully stressed out, and that lead us to make bad choices. And um, it's another way to sort of reframe the stress response is to understand that in many cases, your body will try to motivate you to seek out connection when you're stressed out. And if we give ourselves permission to listen to that signal, you know, maybe stress makes you feel a little bit lonely or stress makes you crave comfort, that's actually your body and brain trying to encourage you to go out and, and be around people who care about you. And that also seems to be an incredible source of willpower. The feeling of being connected actually encourages us to make better choices that are consistent with our goals and values. Hmm. Very interesting. So that makes us, that stress can make us, you know, more of a, a social animal and an increased sense of uh, community, right? Mm-hmm. It can especially when we listen to it. Uh Very good. Well, what else do you, you know, I mean, as a health psychologist, what else do you teach uh, students about this topic? It's so interesting that I I think a lot of, a lot of the world of health doesn't deal enough with psychology. It's more about medicine and things that are considered maybe more of a hard science than a soft science of psychology. Uh, You may not like that I called psychology a soft science, but I think to a lot of people, they, they view it that way. Yeah, it, it, it's soft in the sense that it's incredibly complex. I wish we could do lab experiments that allow us to say, we've proven this, and it's all nice and neat. Um, I would say one of the psychological things that really plays a role in willpower uh, has to do with how we think about our future self. And a lot of the choices we make that lead to negative health consequences come from a place of feeling like your future self is a stranger, that we don't feel uh, that motivated to take care of our future self because it kind of feels like we're throwing away our, our pleasure or our resources and our time on some old person who's somehow not really us. And a lot of the, the most interesting psychological interventions now are trying to help people feel connected to and caring toward their future self to understand that, you know what, when that day comes, it's going to be you. And that experience is going to be just as real and vivid as the experience you're having now. And you really are going to be the recipient of the choices you make today. And so that's something that we we spend some time with in the class and in the book, thinking about ways to to feel connected to your future self so you are willing to invest. I mean, that would, if people were connected to their future self, they'd start eating right, they'd start exercising, and God, they'd stop smoking. I mean, smoking has just got to be the worst thing anybody can possibly do. It, there's just no benefit <laughs> whatsoever, and, and everything about it is negative. You can rationalize that drinking 
it has some benefits, but but smoking just there, there's just nothing. There, there's just nothing there. And and one thing that's important to recognize with all of those behaviors is that they're often an attempt to escape from suffering in the present moment. I mean, it's not like people are weak or stupid. They're in some cases they're making a rational choice that says the pain right now is so bad, or the stress, or the craving is so bad that giving in seems like the rational thing to do because I don't think I can stand this experience I'm having. And one of the other psychological strengths that we spend some time cultivating is trust that you can handle difficult sensations and emotions and experiences. And that's a strength and a trust that needs to be developed over time so that people can actually make choices to delay the cigarette or to not take that drink. Yeah, Cer certainly if they couldn't access it, if it was completely unavailable in the environment, it's not like they would die. They would somehow find a way to muddle through and think things would yeah, but work But in that out. moment, it often feels like it, or it feels like dying would be a preference to the, the suffering or the pain that is present. And I, you know, I actually want to point out that for people who are dealing with behaviors like addiction or smoking, that often they have more willpower than people who have never struggled with addiction. And we can be very quick to judge because it looks like a weakness, but man, people who have made any attempts to overcome addiction have tremendous willpower. Oh, and listen, I completely agree. You know, nicotine has got to be such an incredibly addictive substance because, you know, you look at the warning labels, you go to other countries and you see the, the warning labels that are actually photographs and they're, they're larger than they are in America. It's not like these people don't know, you know. I mean, it's got to be just an incredibly powerful chemical to, you know, overcome all of that rational thought. I mean, I'm not judging in the sense that saying these, these people are dumb or unaware, they know. And, and it just shows you that it's, it's just an incredibly powerful substance. It's, it's amazing. That actually leads me to maybe, you know, one other little quick topic area, and I know we're limited on time here, but escapism. I have long believed, Kelly, that some degree of escapism is actually okay. In fact, uh, and you may totally disagree with me on this, I believe that Maslow's hierarchy should have even included escapism as a concept, uh, you know, some degree of escapism, as long as it's not destructive. But, you know, and maybe you'll say it's always destructive. I don't know. But, you know, it seems like that's sort of a, you know, and it depends the way we do it. We all have our different ways. But it's kind of a pressure release valve all, almost. And it, it, is it okay? Or is it, is it just a bad thing all around? I think it's absolutely okay. There's, I guess you could call it wholesome escapism. There are a lot of activities that give us the experience of being completely immersed in an activity. Could be a great narrative TV series that, that you watch you know, maybe a few episodes of in one sitting. Could be a great book, could be a hobby, could be being outdoors, sports, exercise. There are a lot of activities where we, we, what we're actually escaping is things like you know, the not so helpful habits of the mind that may be keeping us worrying, the, you know, the, the physical pressures that we experience or you know, work that we've left and really want to be able to leave behind. Um, escapism is only a problem when it, when it starts to take over areas of your life where you really should be spending time on something else. But I think people should give themselves permission to do the things that restore them, and it really is not time wasted. Okay, so let's just, before you go, let's just define the types of escapism. So certainly being engaged in physical activity would be considered a good escapism. I mean, just the fact that we're moving, you know, it changes our equilibrium, it changes our state. I don't think anyone would argue that that's a, a good form of escapism. But what about alcohol, for example? That is probably not helpful. And I think the way that you can probably distinguish between the two is uh, how the episode ends. I mean, alcohol in theory, having a glass of wine could be a positive way to restore your yourself. But the things that are not helpful escapisms are the things where they never really end with satisfaction when they start to look more like an addiction. You know, is it the case that you can play a video game for 20 minutes and feel great? Or do you not stop until you pass out? 
And I think some activities are more likely than others to create that cycle of, well, it seems like it's good, but I never can actually get enough of it. You know, spending, sometimes video games, you know, food, drink. These are things where often um, they will continue to trigger the need to engage with them rather than give us a natural sense of completion. You know, very few people are going to exercise themselves to death because they just can't stop. The, the wholesome escapism, we tend to feel nicely resolved at the end of it and ready to re-engage with some other aspect of our life. That, that's a key phrase, I think you said, we feel nicely resolved after it. <laughs> so, yeah, very, very good. Very good distinction. That's, that's great. Well, Kelly, give out your website, if you would. Tell people where they can find out about you. You can find me on the web, on Twitter, and on Facebook by my name, Kelly McGonigal, kellymcgonigal.com. And the, the Willpower Instinct, the book, is available everywhere. Fantastic. Any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave us with? You know, I would say that the number one thing that I hope people um, experience from the book and from the class is to understand that the things that we tend to judge ourselves on, that we, you know, we may believe that we are weak or inadequate because of the struggles we've experienced, that whatever they are, they aren't unique to understand the common humanity of this stuff. And it may be one thing for you and something else for me, but the way we experience challenges around willpower is fundamentally the same. And it's our ability to um, kind of accept that that often gives us the strength to change. Fantastic. Very good points. Dr. Kelly McGonigal, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.